Let me try again. We can flip a switch, make a world of difference. I don't know if you sense it, but there's just a real tenderness in this room this morning. And, uh, you know, as much as, I, as much as I love to come and, and meet you, it's when he's here that it really makes it worthwhile. Right. And I'm sensing that. And uh, I'm hoping I don't mess it up during the next few moments. It's really what I'm, <laughs> what I'm hoping. Um, how many of you have read a, a Francis Chan book? Does that name mean anything to you? A few of you. Francis Chan is a uh, pastor uh, out in California, writer. Um, and in one of his recent books, he talks about a time that he was traveling overseas in India. And he met with a group of uh, pastors and lay leaders. And they talked about some of the challenges that they were facing um, as followers of Jesus in that culture. He said one woman in the group got up and shared about how uh, she was nine months pregnant when she and her husband were forced from their village because they were Christians and how she actually ended up delivering their baby out of the jungle without any help. Another guy got up and took off his shirt and revealed the many, many scars that he had from beatings that he'd received because he was a follower of Jesus. Another guy got up and talked about how his house and his church building had been burned and how they had to start over again in trying to raise the money to have a place to live and a place to worship. And Francis Chan said that as he listened to these men and women share their stories of the price that they had paid for their faith in Jesus, that he just became overcome. He was incredibly humbled by the courage, by the bravery of these folks. He said, but then what happened is they turned around and asked him as a pastor in America, what are some of the struggles you deal with in that setting, in your country? And he said, one of the biggest problems that I deal with is that there's a lot of people who say they're Christians but don't really mean it because their lives don't reflect it. And he said the reaction that he got was like, what? Are, are, are you kidding me? You, you, you don't really mean that, do you? Because here, if, if you're a Christian, you, you can get thrown in jail. You, you can get ostracized, you can be beaten, you can be killed. If you're a Christian, you could lose your home, you could lose your job, you could lose your possessions, your family. Why would anybody say that they're a Christian if they're not serious about it? Because the moment you make that declaration, you become a target. And I was thinking about that. And the thought that came to my mind was, yeah, there are some tremendous privileges. There are some wonderful blessings that we come or that we can experience and know because we live in a free society. But there are pitfalls, I think, as well. And one of those pitfalls, one of those downsides is that for all the opportunities and for all the freedoms and all the options that we have, there is the temptation to turn the things of God, uh, to be around the things of God, rather, and not really be affected by God. And that we can succumb to what I call a cultural Christianity, which is a pseudo-Christianity that, that, that offers... Jesus, but never talks about the cross. That, that, that speaks about uh, the Christian life, but never mentions any cost that's associated with that. That talks about the promise of the resurrection, but never really journeys through Calvary and deals with the crucifixion. There's a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul 
is talking to Timothy and warning him about people who have a form of godliness but deny its power. And I was thinking, that is really what cultural Christianity is all about. People who have a form of godliness, but there's no real power that you see manifested in their lives. And that story from Francis Chan's book really focuses on what I want us to look at during these next few weeks. A series that you look on the front of your worship folder, it's the theme for the series, I Believe in God, But... And you can complete the sentence. And what I want us to look at during this series is this all too common tendency for a lot of people in our culture, in our society, in our country, for a lot of people to say they believe in God, but to live for all practical purposes as if he doesn't exist. And if you were here last week, that's where we began the series. We started down this road. And and, and we talked about how there really are in our day, two kinds of atheists, if you will. There, there are what's called philosophical atheists. The, these are people who, who, who have who've thoughtfully sat down and tried to, to, to weigh the evidence or what they perceive to be all the evidence, and they've concluded that the notion of God's existence simply is not sound. And so as a belief system, they sit there and say, I don't believe in God, philosophical atheists. But there's also a second kind of atheist that's a little more under the radar screen, what I call practical atheists. And these are people who say they believe in God, but yet they don't live as if they do. They don't support what they say they believe by their lifestyle, by their choices. And, and, and my sense is a couple of things. Number one is that practical atheists far outnumber philosophical atheists. And also that practical atheists pose a much greater threat to the church and to Christianity than philosophical atheists. And if we were here last week, you know that we talked about how in many ways the whole issue boils down to our confusion surrounding two concepts that a lot of times we sit there and link and connect and say they're synonymous, but they're not. The concept of believing in God and knowing God. A lot of times we think those two things line up, that they're the same thing, but they are not. Believing in God and knowing God are two vastly different things. And it's when we move from believing in God to knowing God that our lives begin to take shape and there's some level of consistency between what we profess and what we practice, between what we declare and what we do. And so what I want us to look at during these next few weeks What I want us to explore is some of these areas, some of these specific areas where this disconnect, where this gap, if you will, shows up. I want us to look at some of the things that, 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 where the breakdown tends to happen. And I want us to begin to look at it so that we can perhaps begin to address it and perhaps make some changes that can begin to bridge that disconnect and that gap. And so this morning, uh, I want to talk about this whole issue of... uh, of, of, of witnessing or sharing our faith or evangelism. That this gap of, I believe in God, but, but I, don't, I don't really talk about that. That's what I want us to look at this morning. Evangelism. Evangelism is a pretty hot topic for a lot of people. In fact, just to demonstrate how hot a topic it is, let me, let, me, let me ask you if you've heard this one before. Somebody coming up to you or somebody saying, you know, here's the problem I have with you Christians. You know, it's, it's okay for you to believe in Jesus, that, that's just fine. But, but you shouldn't go around trying to convert people. You, you, you shouldn't go around talking about how there's only one way to the top of the mountain. You, you shouldn't say you need to believe this too. 
That's narrow. That, that's, that's arrogant. That's, that's judgmental on your part. How many of you run across that line of thinking somewhere along the line? Yeah. Tim Keller. I don't know if that name means anything to you. He pastors Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan. Wonderful Christian author. Wrote a book a few years ago called The Reason for God. And uh, great book. And, and he talks about these kinds of things. He talks about how people really bristle when we Christians claim that what we believe is superior. That there is only one truth and, and this is the truth. And he said there's been, there's been three major responses throughout the course of history um, to this criticism of, of the Christian faith. He goes, response number one is that people have tried to outlaw it. Response number two is that people have tried to condemn it. And response number three is that people have tried to privatize it. He talks about how many governments in the past have tried to outlaw Christianity, you know, Soviet Russia, um, communist China. It was a, a prisonable offense for you to be a believer in Jesus Christ and to live within those countries. And the reason they tried to outlaw Christianity or the case they made is because Christianity, he said, they said, has so often contributed to social unrest and division and war in the world. But he said, what is so ironic is that so many of these regimes, the, 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 these governments that are so bothered about this link between Christianity and intolerance and violence, he said, if you look back at those governmental systems, they have exhibited a level of intolerance and violence that's never been before seen in the history of this world. That what these people condemn about Christianity they do at every bit as high, if not higher, level. And he said, what's more, they've discovered that the more they try to suppress Christianity, that those efforts have backfired, and it's only served to make the faith system stronger in many circumstances. So he goes, rather than trying to outlaw Christianity, what they've often tried to do, secondly, is just condemn it. And they condemn it by saying, basically, all religions contain an element of truth. All, all belief systems have some facet of the truth, and no one can possibly state that his or her belief system is superior. This is a notion very prevalent, isn't it? And it's a notion that when you examine it, falls under the weight of its own logic. Because think with me. How can you say that no belief system is superior that no belief system is able to see the whole truth unless you believe that you personally possess the comprehensive knowledge that you think none of these belief systems have. You tracking with me? I mean, it's a notion that's hypocritical. None of them have the whole truth, but I have the whole truth to know that none of them have the whole truth. You tracking? I mean, when you, you, you argue that position, it's hypocritical. And, and, and plus, the, the people that have argued that position have typically been every bit as guilty as trying to gain converts and trying to bring people around to their way of thinking as the Christians that they're criticizing. I mean, it's a concept that simply doesn't hold up. So the third response has been to try to privatize the Christian faith. We can't outlaw it, so we, and, and condemning it doesn't work, so we just want you to privatize it. We want you to believe what you want, but we also want you to temper what it is that you believe so that it doesn't enter into the public square. And it's a part of the discussion there, to privatize our faith. And that's a notion, too, that is riddled with inconsistency. Because Christianity, and in fact, not just Christianity, all religious belief systems for that matter, 
Religious belief systems are basically a set of deeply held beliefs that you hold dear regarding what life's about, regarding who we are, regarding the most important things that we should be doing with our time on this planet. That, that's what a religious system of belief is. And, and each of us operates from some system of belief. We operate from some set of faith assumptions that informs every facet of our life. And even the insistence that religion should be excluded from the public square, it flows out of a set of faith assumptions that that person holds. So for somebody to sit there and say, religion should not be allowed to enter the public square, is for that person essentially to say, you can't speak out of your faith assumptions, but I can speak out of mine. It collapses. It, it, it gives way because it finds fault in others regarding something that it excuses in itself. I mean, when you examine a lot of the arguments used to try to suppress Christianity this day, you find that a lot of them, a lot of these lines of thinking meant to discourage us from sharing our faith, they fall apart when you examine them closely. But that doesn't change the fact that we live in a culture that exerts tremendous pressure on us to keep quiet. And you couple that with the internal struggles that many of us feel and deal with. The, uh, I'm afraid, the, the I feel inadequate, the, you know, I'm, I'm not wired to talk to people. The, it's intimidating, that, that kind of stuff. When you, when, you, when you put all these things together, the end result is there are an awful lot of us who say we believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and yet we keep quiet about him. You know, we sit there and say there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, but we never ever speak up and voice anything about that name. So what I want to do this morning, what I want to do is look at this topic of evangelism, and I want to kind of uh, look in broad brushstrokes at, at how it's carried out in the book of Acts by the first followers of Jesus. Because I think we'll see some things in there that'll help us deal with some of these internal and external problems that we are dealing with in these day and time. In fact, there's four words that emerge from the book of Acts um, regarding evangelistic efforts of the first followers of Jesus that I think are helpful, good takeaways for us. I believe effective evangelism is intelligible, Credible, relational, personal. Intelligible, credible, relational, personal. We'll flesh out those words in just a moment. But first, a couple of observations from the book of Acts. Number one, in the book of Acts, when the, when the message of, of, of Jesus began to spread and move outside of Jewish circles, it was largely persecution. That, that drove that to happen. But what's interesting is that the message spread not so much because of the work of the apostles, but because of the work of the rank and file people. It was the non clergy that took the message of Jesus to the rest of the known world at that time. The apostles, for the most part, they stayed put, with the exception of the apostle Paul. It was the non clergy that really took the message of Jesus to the rest of the surrounding world. And second thing, when, when you go through the book of Acts and look at what's going on, you, you, you never see the gospel presented in just one way. You, you never see it presented in just one form. Yes, there is one specific central message that's presented. But there are a number of ways to convey it. There are a number of ways to communicate it, and, and, and wherever and however it's presented, I, I believe it always meets the criteria that I just spelled out. It's intelligible, it's credible, it's relational, it's personal. So, so let's look at those four words. 
in the balance of the time we've got. Number one, intelligibility. The gospel's got to be intelligible to people. I know I've said this an awful lot, but I'm going to say it again because it is so true. We live in a world that has changed a great deal in the last 30 to 50 years. We are living in a day of massive cultural shift and upheaval. And one of the basic changes has to do with the worldview that, that people come and approach life with. In years past, most Americans had a basic understanding of the Christian faith. They, they had a basic Christian worldview, and, and, they, and they believed in things like God and faith and sin. You know, when they talked about who, what God's like, there was pretty much a consensus. And people could sit there and have an understanding of what sin is. But we live in a day where many people don't have that basic framework. They, they've not been shaped by the church. They have no understanding of what it is the Christian faith teaches. A lot of people are unchurched. A number of people other than that are what you could be called dechurched. Is that they may have had some experience at some times in their past in the church, but something happened or for whatever reason they've stepped away and, and they're no longer a part of the church. And then on top of that, there's probably a bigger group of people that you could call lightly churched, which means that they've been in and out of church all their lives, but they never really connected, they never really got involved, they show up at Christmas and Easter and kind of do enough to make themselves feel good, but they know very little about what it is that the church teaches and where it stands. Point being is that in this kind of world, in this kind of society, when we sit there and say things like, Jesus died for you, a lot of people are saying, why? When we sit there and say, people are sinful, they're saying, no, they're not. We're innately good. Many people, when we sit there and say some of these things that are foundational and core to the gospel message, they have no idea what we're talking about. None. Zero. Because they've got their own concepts of God. And they've got their own concepts of sin. And, and, and if they're going to try to listen to what we say, they are going to hear our words through the filter of those concepts that they've got running around inside them. They're going to come to grips with the message of the gospel through their worldview and through their philosophy. And that means that we have got to spend some time establishing a framework so the gospel can just be intelligible to people. I believe that we live in a day where evangelism cannot be an event. It needs to be a process. I believe the days are gone when you can sit down and talk to somebody and present the gospel and do the whole thing in one sitting. Won't happen today. Because people don't have the same concept of God. People don't have the same concept of sin. They don't have the same intellectual framework. And if we try to sit there and blow through things too fast... They'll misunderstand. It's not to say that we should be any less urgent about the fact that people are lost. Yes, it should be a matter of urgency, no doubt. But I think we also need to slow down and take time and try to build some of these bridges so that the gospel message can be intelligible to people. If evangelism is going to work, the gospel's got to be intelligible. Requires a process. Second thing, the gospel needs to be credible to people. It needs to be credible. 
There's a term that's kind of come on the radar screen of, of my life a few years ago that, that's locked on there that's called, let me try to explain it to you, it's called defeater beliefs. And, and, and defeater beliefs are basically those widely accepted cultural assumptions that if they're true means that any notion that is odds with it can't be true. And we've got a lot of defeater beliefs that are at play out in our culture. Here's, a, here's, a, here's one of the most popular ones. There can't be but one true religion. That's a very popular defeater belief in our day. Another defeater belief is the notion that science has disproven Christianity. That when you look at the fossil record and all the findings of science and try to reconcile that with the creation account in Genesis 1, that science has disproven Christianity. Another defeater belief we talked about here in a, a couple of weeks ago, I believe. How, how can we say that there's a good God when there's all the evil and suffering present in the world that's around? I mean, there are a lot of defeater beliefs that are floating around there and people are latching on to. And as long as people latch on to and hold on to these defeater beliefs, Christianity will never seem plausible to them at all. Which means that we've got to very tenderly and considerately show people that these defeater beliefs don't stand up. And that book I referenced earlier, Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God, I'm, I'm, I'm re reading it right now. People have been telling me for six, seven years, you need to read this book, you need to read this book. I'm finally reading this book, and I see why they were telling me that. It is perhaps the best resource I have ever come across that addresses this topic of defeater beliefs and how to lovingly challenge some of the notions that people hold. Don't have time to go into it this morning, but I'd encourage you to, to, to pick that book up and, and read it sometime. It really is a wonderful read, and it's very accessible and understandable as well. Gospel's got to be, number one, intelligible. Number two, it's got to be credible. Number three, it's got to be relational. The gospel's got to be relational. One of the things that I notice as I read through the book of Acts is that evangelism did not primarily happen through a program or through an event. It happened through, it's, it's a Greek word, it called oikos. It happened through one's oikos. That, that word basically means household. That's the simplest English translation for the word. But, you know, when we sit there and think of household, we tend to think of our, our, our closest uh, blood relatives. We tend to think of our nuclear family. But that's not really the, the Greek meaning of the word. When the word oikos is used in, in the Greek language, the, the best way probably, the best way to translate it is to, is to render it circle of connection. You know, your oikos would refer to your parents, your kids, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your immediate family, but it would also refer to your employees if you were a business owner or your coworkers, your, your friends, your, 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 your professional associates, your, 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 your business clients, whoever the case might be. It referred to anybody that you had a meaningful connection and relationship with. That was your oikos. And it was understood that when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you also became a steward of your oikos. And that, that means for us, one of the questions that we need to routinely ask ourselves is, God, who are the people in my oikos? Who are the people in my circle of connection that you want me to pray about, that you want me to reach out to and love and serve? 
Who are the people that you've brought me into some level of connection with that you want to leverage this relationship so that they can eventually come into relationship with you? There was a study a few years back. I don't know how long. But it was uh, done by the Institute of Church Growth. And they surveyed, I want to say, right around 10,000 fairly recent converts to Christ. And they asked these men and women, how is it that you came to Christ? What was the connection? What was the bridge that drew you to Jesus? And there was a few of them that said, you know, they were drawn to him because they, they had a special need and, or they saw an ad in the paper or, or a billboard or, or they attended some church event because of some circumstance that was going on in their life. But, it's, but this, the study concluded that the overwhelming majority, if I remember right, it was somewhere in the 80 to 90 percent range. The overwhelming majority of people who came to the Lord said their first contact was because I was invited by a friend or a family member. That's the power of the oikos. And that's what it means for the gospel to be relational. The message of Jesus moves through the relationships that we have. And one of the challenges for those of us that have been a part of the church for so many years is that every relationship becomes internal. We don't have an oikos of people that don't know the Lord. When we first come to the Lord, perhaps it takes a little bit of focus and attention for us to begin to, to connect with people that are a part of the body of believers. But I think once we've walked in faith for many years, the flip side is true, and we use, need to use that same intentionality and effort to connect with people who are not a part of the body of believers. Because the gospel moves in relational circles. The power of the gospel is relational. And then fourth, finally, the gospel's got to be personal. It's got to be personal. And that means that before you are ever going to be effective at reaching somebody else's heart, the message has got to pierce your heart. It's got to do a number on you. It's got to be real to you. But before you can ever reach somebody else, you've got to drink deeply of God's goodness and experience Him for yourself. Before you can ever be a witness, you've got to have a testimony. You can't commend to others what you don't cherish yourself. The late Brennan Manning he said it so well. He said, the greatest single cause of atheism today is professing Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips but deny him by their lives. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unacceptable. And that quote really brings us back to what is the heart of why we're doing this series. People who profess Jesus with their lips, but they don't substantiate that profession by their lives. And I want to say something, and in saying it, I'm not, I'm not trying to be harsh, and I'm not trying to be mean-spirited at all. It just comes out of such a deep place in me. If you deep down inside really don't intend to live a life that's pleasing to God, then please back off the profession and don't mess it up for those of us that are trying. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be harsh or, or mean or anything, but, but folks, if the gospel's not personal to you, if you've, if you've not been changed by this incredible message, that's been entrusted to the church. If you've not been changed, you're not going to live an attractive life. 
And the reason why your life's not going to be attractive to the surrounding world is because your hopes and your dreams and your securities and your values, they're going to be rooted in something other than Jesus. And if that's the case, then you're going to be just as materialistic. You're just going to be as angry, as anxious, as unforgiving as anybody else around. And when that is the case, when there are people that are living lives that way, it chips away. It chips away at the validity and the credibility and the believability of those of us who are striving to demonstrate with our lives that this gospel message does change people. And it changes people for the better. And so my hope, my my, my prayer is for each of us that during these next few weeks is that God will embed deep within our hearts that will, he will embed a vision of the lengths to which he went to redeem us. And that it will create within us a boldness. That it will create within us a, a, a desire to go out and be the hands and the feet and the voice and the touch of Jesus. Because folks, we've got good news. Amen. We've got good news. We've got a message that is worth being shared. We've got a message that needs to be shared. We've got a message that this world is longing to hear. But the place it begins is not by moving our lips. It begins by living our lives in ways that are consistent with Him. And then, as opportunity presents itself, having the courage to speak about why it is they see what it is they see when they look at us. That's how it's meant to work. And my hope and my prayer is that we can be a people through whom it does work. I want you to stand. And let's just pause, heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, again, I'm just amazed at your ability by your Spirit to take to take insights from your word that was penned hundreds, thousands of years ago and make them so pertinent and relevant to who and where we are right now. Thank you for doing that. But Father, we also know that you, your word tells us that we're not just to be hearers of the word, we're to be doers of it. And Father, for all of us, there's probably a do that we need to attend to in the wake of what we've heard this morning. So Father, would you lovingly keep the points of application before us that we need to act upon in the hours and days to come? Would you not let us walk away from that? But would you continue to drive the message home? that we need to substantiate what it is we say we believe by how it is that we live. Point out, Father, those areas of duplicity. Point out those areas of inconsistency so that we can truly hold up to the scrutiny of a skeptical world. And there could be an authenticity and a genuineness about us to where when people encounter us, they can see you. Father, that's a deep work that only you can do. And so we invite you to do it in your way and in your time. And for that, we'll be thankful. We ask your blessing, Father, upon us as we go. Go with us. Accompany us, empower us, use us. And we'll give you praise and glory for every good thing that happens. We ask in Jesus' name, people agreed and said, 
Amen. Thanks so much, folks, for being here today. Have a great, great day. See you real soon. There's some sign-up sheets as well at the, work, at the Welcome Center. Be sure and slip by there before you get away if you need to.